I can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. I think we have all the localities now. Fantastic. Call the meeting to order and uh, go ahead and have a statement read. Great. Thanks, Brian. Pursuant to the declared state of the emergency in the Commonwealth of Virginia in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to protect the public health and safety of the working group members, staff, and the general public, today's meeting is being held electronically via WebEx. These electronic meetings are required to complete the essential business on behalf of our region. For the requirements of the Code of Virginia, we are posting the meeting with notice, the agenda, and supporting documentation on the HRTPO website for public review. We also provided electronic copies of this information to our working group members and other interested parties. Today's meeting is being recorded and will be available after the meeting through the HRTPO website. Members of the public were invited to submit comments to the working group in advance of today's meeting via email or phone call, and no public comments were received as of 48 hours uh, before this meeting. Before we begin today's meeting, I would like to review a few housekeeping rules, which are important as we complete this meeting. We ask that all participants remain on mute with their phones and computers until they are providing input. After speaking, please remember to go back on mute. Second, please identify yourself by name and locality or agency when speaking or providing a motion or a second. And third, all votes taken today must be made by roll call and recorded in the minutes. On behalf of the HRTPO staff, we wanna thank you for your commitment to our region and your cooperation and patience as we work through this electronic meeting. Um, so with that, let me share the screen and we can View attendance. And we'll start with uh, Chesapeake, Troy Eisenberger. A present. Thank you, Troy. Welcome. Uh, Brian Stelly. Present. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, City of Norfolk, Rob Brown. Present. Thank you, Rob. And Debbie Mangerasina. Here. Thank you, Debbie. For Portsmouth, Carl Jackson. Here. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Suffolk, Robert Lewis. Present. And Jason Souders. Present. Great, thank you. Great uh, attendance for a Friday afternoon. Uh, we move on to the port. Uh, Barb Nelson. With VDOT, Scott Smizek. Present. Thank you, Scott. Todd Hallisey. Tim Hainum. Eric Stringfield. Present. Good afternoon, Eric. Uh, Ray Hunt. Nina Org. Good afternoon, present. Thank you, Nina. Samba Seca. With HR Tech, Kevin Page. Present. Good afternoon, Kevin. And in terms of TPO staff, I believe I'm the only one here. So did I miss anybody uh, on the attendance? Keith, this is Pavitra. I just got in. Oh, you did join. Okay. Anybody else? Great. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Brian. Thanks, sir. I looked uh, reasonably short agenda. Do we have any modifications or corrections? All right, hearing none, I look for a consensus, uh, a motion approved by consensus. So moved. Thanks, sir. I have a motion of second. Second. Thanks, sir. Rob Brown, to you north. Uh, motion a second. Do you have any objections to the motion? All right, hearing now, so the motion passes. I had no public comments. Moving on to item number four minutes from the April meeting. I trust everyone has had time to review them. Have any corrections or modifications requests? All right, hearing none, I get a motion to approve by consensus. Robert Lewis, so moved. Thanks, sir. Motion to uh, second. Rob Brown, second. Thanks, sir. Any objections to the motion? I'm hearing none. Motion passes. This is to item number five, general study update. By Mr. Smizer.
afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me, and uh, glad to be here on this beautiful Friday to provide an update on where we are with the Bowers Hill study. Um, thanks to whoever is running the slides. Uh, I believe we met in April. I briefed the group on this. I won't go into too much detail unless there's questions, but just a reminder for everything that has gone into informing the range of alternatives that will be carried through the study. Um, we, we've solicited public input already two or three times through the course of the study. And, and most recently was our February and March citizen comment opportunity, which was an all virtual opportunity for folks to log on, um, look at materials, watch a narrated PowerPoint, um, explaining those materials to them, and then we had an online uh, survey form for folks to you know, provide some answers to our questions, but also um, opportunity for them to provide their own thoughts you know, outside of the questions we were asking. Also solicited and accepted comments through the study email address, and we received one written comment during that period as well. So it's important, um, our, the process we take these studies through requires public input before we seek concurrence from the agencies on any of the major milestones. So we use this system comment opportunity as the public opportunity to inform concurrence on the range of alternatives. Any questions on the public outreach piece? The next slide, please. You may also remember from previous presentations, one of the first and most important steps in the NEPA process is the identification and then concurrence on the purpose and need. And what's on the screen right now is the, what we would call the purpose and need statement. It sets the goals for the study, but more importantly in the phase right now, it also serves as the primary criteria in the alternative screening process. Um, so there's three bullets there at the bottom, reduce congestion, improve travel reliability, and provide additional travel choice are, are kind of the three things we're weighing all the different options we considered against these three elements. Um, if, if an option meets the purpose and need, meets these three elements, it is retained for detailed study in the EIS. If the option does not meet the three purpose and need elements, it is not retained for detailed study. It is, however, documented in the EIS, and we would explain um, why it was not retained. So we'd explain how it does not meet the purpose and need. So we, we've gone through this process with the agencies involved um, for the last few months, you know, putting these options on the table in front of them, discussing how they do or do not meet the purpose and need, getting public input on those options, and then finally making a recommendation to the agencies and getting their concurrence on the range of alternatives. And we did receive concurrence on the range of alternatives uh, just a few weeks ago, earlier in this month. So I'm here today to present the outcome of that concurrence process and talk through which options are being retained for detailed study and those that are not. Next slide, please. So as you may know, a, a no build or no action alternative is required in an EIS level study. So while this option does not meet any of the need elements, it will be retained and carried through the EIS uh, as a benchmark or for comparing the build alternatives to a no build condition. And worth pointing out, uh, the illustrative typical section we have on the screen, uh, that word varies is important because it is not a consistent median throughout the corridor. Next slide, please. So one of the first options that was considered was to add one general purpose lane in each direction. Um, this would reduce congestion by providing some additional capacity. Though I know the traffic folks out there will tell you if you add a lane, most likely it's just going to get filled in with more demand and 
our traffic would show that it does not reduce congestion over the long term. Um, this alternative does provide some additional capacity, which would improve travel reliability, but again, the question would be for how long. And then providing additional travel choice, it does not meet this need element. And I think it's important to unpack what's included in this need element a bit. When we talk about travel choice, um, we are informed by previous NEPA studies on this corridor in which uh, Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transit did some ridership studies and projections and found that a transit-only lane would not take enough vehicles off the road to make it worthwhile. So for the past studies, including this study that we've done in this corridor, DRPT is on the record that there is no need for transit-only lanes and therefore travel choice comes through uh, improving transit movement through the corridor and or offering some type of HOV or HOT option vehicles to, to make a choice on how they want to travel through the corridor. Um, you know, input from the agencies who are part of this working group, but who also participate in our monthly agency meetings, highlighted two other elements of the travel choice need. One, um, that, that transit is, element is important. There are regional plans that call for improved transit along this corridor. And so finding a travel choice option that does improve the movement of transit through the corridor, understanding that travel lanes or transit lanes themselves are not necessary, is a part of this need element, as is consistency with local plans. So part of the reason we have expanded the Bowers Hill study to include portions of 664 was knowing that the Hampton Roads Express Lane Network was coming online. Um, so when we provide additional travel choice, we want to do so in a manner that is consistent with regional plans that are outside of our study area so that we're not creating an alternative that just creates new bottlenecks. Next slide, please. So concept B was to add two general purpose lanes in each direction. We also recommended that we not retain this option for the same reasons that we did not retain the add one general purpose lane in each direction, but for there's more lanes in this one. So next slide, please. Concept C was to add one part-time drivable shoulder in each direction. I'm sorry, to add one managed lane in each direction with a part-time drivable shoulder as part of the managed lane system. This option would reduce congestion, not only by providing additional capacity, but providing it in some type of managed lane system that, for lack of a better word, could be managed um, to make sure it was reducing congestion. Likewise, that, that managed lane system could be controlled to make sure you had a reliable trip through the corridor. And then finally, this option would meet the travel choice need because a managed lane system provides some type of choice for HOV and HOT. And buses that can operate in an HOV or HOT lane um, experience that travel time advantage is the term they use. So buses are moving through the corridor faster, making them more attractive for use and creating another travel choice. So we did recommend that this option be retained as an alternative for detailed study in the EIS. Next slide, please. So much like the previous concept, this is also a managed lane concept. This would add two managed lanes in each direction. It meets the needs similar to the previous, and we recommend retaining this one as well. Um, pause for a second. Uh, actually, before I pause, something to point out with all of these. Uh, on these typical sections, we are showing the new lanes here in the inside. Uh, that, that was just for illustrative purposes at this point. Um, now that we have concurrence in the range of alternatives, the engineering team can start taking a deeper dive into how these typical sections would actually lay out on the study area. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of this presentation. 
Um, any questions on the options we've gone through so far before I move on? Hearing none. Um, next slide, please. Concept E was to add collector and distributor lanes or CD lanes around the interchanges on 664 and some type of similar improvement at Bowers Hill. Um, it would not address the entire corridor and the available traffic data suggests that there is congestion on the corridor outside of the interchanges. So it would not address the entire corridor. Um, because it would only address the interchange areas, it would not necessarily improve travel reliability throughout the corridor. And outside of the interchanges, it would not provide additional travel choice. So we recommended not retaining this alternative, and it was not retained. Next slide, please. And the TSM TDM option, I know we've gone through this a few times before. This option is informed by a separate VDOT study of 64 and 664, looking at improvements that could be made, you know, in TSM TDM style improvements that could be made along 664. That, that study found the only real need for improvement or available improvements within the interstate corridor on 664 South Side was to extend one on and off ramp and to enhance bus service. So those improvements on their own would not reduce congestion except for maybe that one ramp, uh, would not improve travel reliability but for that one ramp. And while there may be enhanced bus service, if there was no other improvements, those buses would be stuck in the same congestion and unreliable traffic that they experience today. So we did not feel that would provide an additional travel choice. So we recommended that this one not be retained as a standalone alternative, but with a clear understanding that it could be applied to a preferred alternative or could be applied during detailed design and construction. And the agencies concurred with that earlier this month. Next slide, please. And then we also had a, you may remember, we had a transit only option. Um, this one will not be retained for detailed study as it does not reduce congestion. It does not improve travel reliability because transit would be stuck in the same congestion and unreliable traffic as they are today. And we did not see that as being a true travel choice. And the agencies concurred on that as well earlier this month. Next slide, please. So this summarizes um, what was concurred upon earlier this month. We have three alternatives advancing for detailed, well, in advancing through the study. One, the no build alternative. Another alternative to add one managed lane on the part-time drivable shoulder in the managed lane system. And a second alternative to add two managed lanes. The one, two, three, the five options listed below will not be retained for detailed study or consideration in the EIS, but they will be documented in terms of the work we've presented to this group to date and why they did not meet the purpose and need. And for those like TSM, TDM, or CD lanes that are not precluded from future consideration, that will be made clear in the EIS as well. Uh, the assumptions informing the agencies concurrent this month we are developing interchange access reports um, that is required by federal highway to be developed alongside the NEPA study. Um, so we are underway with the IAR and the interchange configurations that are assumed in the EIS will be based on that IAR. Um, we're not going to attempt to lay out complex interchange options without doing this work. So really the IAR will tell us that's the one. Um, the NEPA study itself won't prescribe that specific interchange configuration, but will lay out a, what I call it limits of disturbance around mm -hmm. that configuration. And, and what will be approved through NEPA is that bubble in which the interchange fits. So post NEPA, as this process advances through more detailed design and then eventually construction, it's assumed that the IAR will be revisited as you know, more detailed traffic data are available 
and his designs in advance. And as long as the future interchanges fit within those NEPA bubbles, there, there's no concern or additional work required. If the interchanges come outside of those bubbles, that's not a deal breaker either. Um, a small NEPA effort, nothing like what we're going through now, much smaller than this effort, can be done to incorporate any little bits and pieces of the interchanges that jut outside those bubbles. So this strategy provides uh, the region and VDOT with the most flexibility to move forward with not only design considerations, but also commercial considerations and interchanges and will not require another EIS or an SEIS if any changes are made. It is worth reminding the group that once the record of decision is issued in spring, summer of 2023, that has a shelf life of approximately three years before it would need to be revisited. Uh, again, that does not mean you have to do another EIS or an SEIS. Uh, a much smaller reevaluation effort can be undertaken just to make sure all the data and assumptions are still right and give that thing another three years of life. Um, so that allows you to make these interchange considerations um, over the next few years and not at the last minute in your construction. As the IAR is revisited, the NEPA footprint can also be revisited and make sure they're developing together over the next couple of years. And then finally, we've presented these options to the public, to this group, and to the agencies, being clear that we had not made any decisions as if to widen to the outside or the inside, and that that would be decided following concurrence. Um, so we got concurrence this month without determining whether it's inside or outside. So these alternatives that are advancing um, are not prescribing that at this time. Uh, I do have some more information on that, but before I get into it, uh, pause again and welcome any questions, comments, discussion on the list of alternatives that will advance and those that will not advance in the EIS. All right. Hearing none, the next slide is just a discussion slide, but we can jump to that just to look at the problem we're trying to solve today. And you know, for your information, just a couple other topics to touch on. The first being that idea of are we going to widen to the outside or the inside? <coughs> Excuse me. So for about the last three or four months, we've had some great support and participation from DRPT in the Port of Virginia um, to look at this corridor and determine if it is feasible in the current situation to consider rail in the median. And that work was informed first by DRPT, providing us a typical section for what one rail line would look like and what a double track or two rail lines, what that typical section would look like. Um, we applied that typical section to our entire study area and kind of came to two different conclusions. Uh, beginning at Virginia 164, rail does enter the median of 664 and travel south in the median so just past the Pewsville Road interchange where it then exits the, the median and does not exist anywhere else in, six, in our study area. So where there is rail today, the EIS will assume to widen to the outside. And it will do that because at this stage, we don't have survey, nor will we take our designs to a, a, a level of detail that would allow us to fully determine if you could fit rail and roadway in that median. The port does have plans to perhaps double track that existing rail, and, and that's not really um, weighing on our consideration that that is something that's out there, but it's more just a lack of detail we would need to make that determination. So where there is existing rail, EIS will show widening to the outside, but will also allow widening to the median should it be determined it's feasible when you advance in the more detailed design. South of Pewsville Road, where there is currently no rail, we found that the median was not wide enough to allow even a single track to be laid down between the roadway. Uh, again, that 
you know, we do NEPA, we don't assume design waivers, design exceptions or anything like that. So where there's a will, there's a way, I'm sure. But the, the median would need to be upwards of 15 to 25 feet wider, depending on single track or double track to fit rail in there. So based on that, you know, we presented our findings to DRPT in the port and DRPT agreed with VDOT that it was not reasonable to continue to consider rail in the median as part of this study. Again, that does not preclude future considerations of how rail may operate or not operate on 664. But for the purposes of this study, it allows us to assume widening to the median to the greatest extent practicable south of Pewsville and heading into the Bower Cell Interchange. Any questions, comments on that? Hearing none. Um, we've also talked to this group about how under current NEPA regulations, there is a requirement to not only obtain Federal Highways NEPA approval, but also to obtain any other federal authorizations or approvals that are necessary uh, to advance the project. So that would mean getting permits if we needed to. We are fully aware that water quality permits will be required for this project. It's, it's pretty wet out there. So we know that alongside the Federal Highway Record of Decision, there will be an Army Corps of Engineer permit there will be a Virginia DEQ permit, there will be a Virginia Marine Resources or VMRC permit. Th those permits are not as detailed as some may be used to um, in other projects because these agencies also have to comply with this federal directive. They issue permits for the NEPA footprint, which again allows a lot more flexibility not only for design, but also allows flexibility in the future for future design to reduce impacts and therefore reduce mitigation costs. So just like the IAR, just like the NEPA documents, when those permits are issued, there is certainly opportunity to revisit them and modify them between the end of NEPA and when you go to construction. What we've learned over the last few weeks and as early as this afternoon, um, first, the Coast Guard has determined that this project is exempt from its permitting process. So the two bridge water crossings that occur on 664 will be exempt from the Coast Guard permitting process for the next five years. So there are no Coast Guard permits required. That is, of course, a five-year exemption, but a request for an additional exemption can be made before the existing one runs out, and that could perhaps extend into design and construction of this project. And as of this afternoon, we also confirmed that there are no FAA permits or approvals required given the proximity of the Hampton Roads Executive Airport. During the EA study, the Virginia Department of Aviation expressed some concern that the interchange design may create some hazards for traffic, air traffic, but um, we've been able to show them we're, we're staying well below their airspace, so no FAA permits or approvals required at this time. As the project advances into detailed design and means and methods are better understood, that would be one that would be revisited just to check in, not that it's required, but once you know the height of the cranes, for example, that will be working on this thing, that's the type of thing uh, a design team would share with the FAA before getting approval. So I've kind of jumped ahead to the end of the study, talking about records of decision and permits, but maybe more importantly, talk about the formal beginning of the study, which now that we have concurrence in the range of alternatives, Federal Highway can formally initiate the EIS, which comes through a notice of intent or NOI. I think we've talked to this group about that before. Um, initially, we were hoping the NOI would be issued this week. Um, but those new NEPA regulations have also greatly raised the bar on what Federal Highway needs to include in its notice of intent. The notice of intent for Bowers Hill has the potential to be the first in the country that Federal Highway issues under its new regulation, if not the first, absolutely the second. 
And as you can imagine, that gets a little more scrutiny from headquarters. And also it took a, more time for Federal Highway to put together. Um, so we're looking at a June, early June notice of intent, which does not change our schedule at all. We're still on track to have study complete in spring of 2023. It just kind of fudges the numbers a bit, a bit you could say, in terms of when the study officially starts and ends. When the notice of intent is issued, that comes with a 45-day public comment period that is announced in the Federal Register. Um, I don't think too many people read the Federal Register every day, so VDOT will couple that announcement with website and mailing list announcements to let folks know the NOI has been issued, um, that there is a public comment opportunity available. The website will have some updated materials to explain to the public, here's where we were in February, March with these dozen different options. Here's where we are today with three that are advancing and why they are advancing. And we'll use our website and email as a place to submit comments as well to inform Federal Highway. And then finally, you know, as part of that formal beginning of the NEPA process, it's also time to formalize agencies' roles in the study. So the localities, Suffolk and Chesapeake, in which the study area falls in, as well as HRTPO and HRTAC, <coughs> excuse me, have been invited, um, I'm sorry, Portsmouth is on that list as well, have been invited to formally join the study, and we appreciate those who have already responded. Um, that will be documented in the EIS, you know, the formal roles each agency has, so that's an important step as well. And as I'm starting to lose my voice for a second, I will pause and welcome any questions or comments you might have. We have questions for the floor. Scott, you've done such an excellent job. We're stunned in silence. <laughs> Uh, I did have a question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Scott, it's, it's, uh, it's okay to ask. When did you say the notice of intent? Uh, I, I lifted. it. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, we don't have any, <clears throat> excuse me, an exact date on the notice of intent. Uh, we're hoping first, second week in June, uh, Federal Highway submitted to headquarters, and when headquarters is good with it, it will be sent to the EPA to be published in the Federal Register. So I might get a few days had you know a few days notice when it's headed that way but we'll just have to keep our eyes out for it okay and then the study group that you're pulling together when would they need to be involved i mean right i right now i'm assuming you had i think may 29th was your deadline to send in responses to the letter you sent out right so when do you anticipate the group kind of getting started is it after the noi this issue yeah the noi doesn't change that process too much. It, it, it is the, the formal start. We'll continue to have our monthly agency meeting the second Wednesday of the month. We'll continue to come back here when we have substantive updates, like concurrence, some range of alternatives. Um, we actually did, uh, just this week, I received the TPO's letter, you know, accepting your roles. That's great. Um, so if you've not responded and you've received one of those letters, I'd say in the next two weeks, if you can get something back to us, and that can just be an email to me as well. That'll do it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, Robert Lewis. Hey, Scott, um, I, I think I remember the city getting a letter on that, but I'm not sure we have responded. I'm searching my emails now. Is there any possibility you can verify who has and has not uh, responded and the ones of us that have not advised us so we can find that and get that process for you? Absolutely, we'll do. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from the floor? All right, here, another thank you all for spending your Friday afternoon with us, and uh, we'll see you again here soon. We'll stand at Hey, Scott, are you still on the line? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I just found that letter. Uh, looks like it was dated April 29th. So 
what do you need in return? Do you just need an email? Do you need a formal letter back? Or how do we need to do this? Um, any of the above, the simplest can just be an email to me saying you've received the letter on such a date and you accept your role as a participating agency. Um, if you want to send a formal letter back, that, that's great as well. Okay. All right. I will try to get you an email this afternoon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, ready, last and final. Thank you. Thank you.